organized by the Faculty of Social Science and Languages of Sapargama University of Sri Lanka. Uh, as you may be well aware, the first ICSSL uh, is scheduled to be held on the 11th and 12th of January 2023. And uh, this two-day workshop that you are part of is organized in line with ICSSL 2023. So without much ado, let me invite our conference chairperson, Dr. Sumadi Sambaravira, to brief you on the conference and our overarching objective of conducting this pre-conference workshop. Ma'am? Yes, thank you, Ashani. Good morning, all of you. Our resource person, Dr. Manoj Samaratunga, Dean, uh, Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages, all heads of the departments, and all distinguished academic staff members, all authors of ICSSL 2023, administrative and other staff members, all other scholars, and my dear students. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the first pre-conference workshop on qualitative data analysis with special reference to case studies organized by the Faculty of Social Sciences, organized by the Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages. Sabargama University of Sri Lanka as a sub-activity of the first international conference on social sciences and languages, which is, which is scheduled to be held from 11th to 12th January 2023. The conference is planned to be held under the theme of enhancing the quality of life through innovative strategies for sustainable development. The conference will emphasize the need for more innovative strategies for sustainable development and thereby organizing both modern scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge for enhancing the quality of life in a severe economic, social and environmental crisis of the country. It will serve as a platform that brings together a vast array of stakeholders from a wide range of disciplines toward achieving workable solutions for present day challenges by promoting scientific discussions. The conference will comprise keynote speeches, plenary speeches from eminent scholars, oral presentations, and pre conference workshops. I am extremely delighted to announce the first pre conference workshop with one of the eminent scholars in the field of qualitative research today. First, I would like to warmly welcome our resource person of the day, Dr. Manoj Samaratunga, Senior Lecturer in the Department of Tourism and Hospitality Management, Rajarati University of Sri Lanka for the event. And he's not a new person for the Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages, and we all are familiar with this great research personality. Next, uh, Dr. Sampath Fernando, Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages, and all heads of the department, professors, all academic staff members of Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages, all authors of the conference who joined with us today, and all students participated with the event virtually with their Beshi work schedules due to examinations, and I warmly welcome to the forum all members who have participated with this event to assist us are also warmly welcome to the forum. Have a fruitful and hardworking day for all of you. And over to you, Ms. Ashan. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, our Dean, Dr. Sampath Fernando, who is an avid researcher himself, uh, is here with us. Sir, we would like to listen to your thoughts on the event as well. Okay, thank you, Ashani. Uh, good morning, everyone. The resource person, Dr. Manoj Samaratunga, the heads of the department of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages, all the academic staff members of the faculty, as well as there are some uh, academic staff members from other faculties, as well as other universities also. And there are some students who are joining with us this uh, for this workshop. And uh, there are some authors of our first uh, international conference. So I welcome all of you for, uh, for this particular uh, workshop. I think all, already we had some experience with uh, Dr. Mano Samaratunga. He's very capable in this field. So uh, I think uh, if you are talking about the present situation of the country, there, uh, there are various uh, problems. Uh, so very recently we have to uh, family with some uh, climate change as well. So considering all those difficulties, I think we have power problem also. Even the resource person suffered from some natural uh, disasters in his area. 
So with all and all, I think uh, these are some uh, encouraging factors for this workshop. So uh, rather than taking much more time, uh, I, I would like to uh, welcome the resource person and all the audience for this workshop. I think these three hours will be a very fruitful hours for us to enhance our, especially the uh, qualitative data analysis uh, capability. So, we are, so our expectation is to empower you with the qualitative tools, special, uh, especially the case studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your encouraging words. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let's commence the workshop. So as the chairperson rightly said, the resource person for today's workshop is no stranger to Sabra Community City, as well as our faculty. Uh, so to introduce the resource person and to welcome him to commence the workshop, let me invite Professor Manohari Udupuru, chairperson, workshop organizing committee. Ma'am? Yes, uh, good morning to all. I think uh, I am audible to you, Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages, Conference Chair, Secretary, and all, uh, all the members of the Conference Organizing Committee, uh, Dr. Manoj Samarthunga, resource person of today's workshop, uh, all the academic staff members and all the participants. Actually, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our resource person of today's workshop, Dr. Manoj Samarthunga. Dr. Manoj Samarthunga is a senior lecturer in the, department of, uh, in the Department of Tourism and Hospitality Management, Faculty of Management Studies, Radharati University of Sri Lanka. He obtained his uh, bachelor uh, honor degree in Tourism and Travel Services Management from Sabargama University of Sri Lanka in the year 2010 and a master degree in the field of Tourism, Economics and Hotel Management from the University of Colombo in 2014. His PhD is from the field of Tourism Planning and Management from the Chichuan University, China uh, in 2020. Dr. Manoj Samarthunga is a prominent researcher and has made a significant contribution to the field of Tourism Management by carrying out extensive research dissemination uh, knowledge through many publications, delivering lectures on different themes of the discipline while undertaking various consultancies. His main uh, research and expertise areas are qualitative research and in vivo, tourism planning and development, post-disaster uh, tourism in South Asia, post-war tourism, peace building, host guest uh, relationships, and application of guests uh, in tourism. He serves as a coordinator of the International Center for Interdisciplinary Cultural Heritage and Tourism Research of uh, China and Sri Lanka, and he is also the president of Sri Lankan research community, which is aimed at uh, improving the research capacity of academics in Sri, Lanka, in Sri Lanka. He is a prominent researcher, author, verified uh, peer, peer reviewer, editorial board member, and a tourist consultant. In addition to all these, Dr. Manoj Samarthunga is an expert in the field of computer-aided qualitative data analysis with uh, specialized uh, knowledge on the NVO software. Uh, with uh, this expertise, he has become a well-known and experienced person, resource person in this field of qualitative data analysis. He, uh, he has well contributed to improve the research capacity of academics in Sri Lankan universities by conducting workshops organized by the universities for staff development, as well as for local and international conferences. Furthermore, he has conducted many workshops on qualitative uh, research and qualitative data analysis uh, for uh, other educational institutions, uh, research institutions, local authorities, and uh, business firms locally and internationally. Thus, I believe that we have actually chosen the ideal uh, resource person for our first day workshop. Uh, as social scientists, uh, we all use qualitative data and sometimes analyzing and interpreting qualitative data may be somewhat complex and confusing. Therefore, better understanding, knowledge and skills are compulsory to work in this field. Actually, I am happy, uh, very happy that uh, we have considerable amount of participants for this workshop. So I think uh, you will essentially enjoy this workshop and will be uh, benefited from the workshop. So I cordially invite Dr. Manoj Samarthunga to commence the workshop, which is qualitative data analysis with the special reference to case studies. Thank you very much. Uh, I go on. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Am I audible? 
Am I audible enough? Yes. Right. Perfect. So uh, again, uh, greetings from Rajarat University of Sri Lanka. This part of uh, Sri Lanka, Anuradhapura Mihintal is again uh, wet uh, for a couple of days now. Uh, and it's cold weather feeling like being back in Sabaragam University because I know we really love the climate there. So, uh, so today I'm uh, very much pleased to uh, uh, join with the, uh, our colleagues, uh, the academics at the Sabaragam University and especially I'm thankful to the uh, conference chairs and Professor Manohari Udupur for inviting me and uh, thank you Dean Sir, Dr. Sampath Fernandu for uh, inviting me and all the, uh, the and which is a very much needed uh, topic to discuss uh, at the present context because I believe that uh, the new knowledge, uh, the contribution of uh, new knowledge, especially to the body of education be done mainly through the qualitative uh, research. But when we take a, a cross-section of Sri Lankan uh, education system and again the research culture, we do not see that many qualitative research getting published in index journals. And we also do not see some um, high quality uh, masters or the PhD research uh, uh, getting done um, in, the, in the system. Uh, but yes, quantitative research are dominating for many decades now, uh, and we have to take the trend to the next level to shed more light into the academia and thereby contribute to the body of knowledge. So with that, let's uh, start the session. I'm going to share my presentation. Right, so uh, I hope my screen is clear. Is it visible? Ms. Yes. 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 Yes, it is right. okay. Yes. Right. Perfect. right, thank you. So uh, before starting the session, I have make a small disclaimer. Whenever I'm starting my sessions, speeches, I make a disclaimer because the knowledge is also a kind of a subjective thing because we as academic, we, academics, we believe what we, uh, what we have read is correct. Although there are many subjective errors, judgments, prejudices on our, uh, on our learnings as well. So the content we will discuss today is purely based on my own experience. Uh, and there's no uh, absolute truth in the social sciences rather it depends on how well we refine or how we how well we define refine rectify and justify it the examples i'm using are purely based on what i have learned as important in not only in qualitative research methods but also on how to communicate it and develop quality of the content and you're free to hold different opinions i respect that about research and knowledge knowledge creation and dissemination as knowledge is also based on our lived experience and so uh, today the discussion topics are what is a case study and when to do a case study and when not to do a case study and identifying a strong case, what features should we really look at and collecting the, the data and analyzing the case study data and reporting the case study findings. In the meantime, I will be sharing uh, many research articles, many cases with you uh, on uh, the case studies I have practically conducted and the challenges we faced and how we especially overcome them and how to identify these gaps and, and overcome the validity and the reliability issues, which are burning issues in the field of qualitative research. So uh, I hope all of you are uh, familiar with the research onion of Saunders. So uh, we have the first step, the research philosophy, we have to decide what philosophy we are following. And thereafter we have the research approach and thereafter methodological uh, choice. And fourth step is the research strategy. So today we are going to talk about the case studies, which is a research st strategy. We are not going to talk about the research philosophy, research approach, 
and the methodological choice. Even though you have decided to or not to conduct case studies in your advanced studies, you still need to go through, you need to uh, finalize what your research philosophy is and your research approach is and what methodological choices you are going to select and thereafter you have to finalize your research strategy and today hopefully after this session you will get some uh, some knowledge i'll try my level best um, about uh, to to pour some uh, case study related knowledge to you so what is a case study different uh, scholars interpret that in different way and to be frank so far i have uh, identified uh, about more than two dozens of definitions about case studies. Similar summary. When it comes to case, the scholars are also at the argument to identify or to demarcate what a case is. Is it a person are we going to talk? Or is it a group of people are we going to talk? Or is it a village? Or a community are we going to talk or are we going to consider as a case or is it an incident or is it a phenomena that we are going to consider or can we consider a region a country as a case or can we consider an organization a process of an organization as a case or can we consider some medical procedures as a case Actually, according to the according to my readings, all of these can be considered as cases. All these can be considered as cases. Right. So we as qualitative research, we need to clearly demarcate what our boundary is. You can talk about a person, you can talk about an incident, you can talk about a religion, right? But you need to clearly demarcate your boundary, what you're going to talk. And that is your case. That is why we call it a case study. So some steps could be similar depending on the nature and the width and the depth of the case. But sometimes, some steps are different case to case. For instance, if you're considering a person as a case, the way you are going to collect the data could be different from a case where you, can, where you consider an organization as your unit of analysis, right? So we can give you a rule of thumb here, but some guidelines on conducting case studies. So let's take them one by one. And with some examples, let's go forward to understand the scope of the case study and what it really do and what we really have to achieve. I just wanted to share one, uh, one of my publications here, the transitional domestic tourist guest in a post-war destination, a case study of Jaffna, Sri Lanka. I'll be coming back to this paper a little later, but I just wanted to introduce. In the meantime, in the chat box, you can see the uh, the link shared by Ms. Rupa Singh. You can download all the related research materials, workshop materials here. And uh, please do not uh, send the thank you, thank you messages. Then I'm getting distracted and I want to open the message and check whether you have any problems. And at, the, uh, at every 10 or 15 minutes, I'll give you an opportunity to ask the question. So in that uh, wait for that moment and then we can uh, visit back in our slides and discuss it a little further. Now, in this particular case, a case study of Japanese, we were trying to, we tried to identify the tourist gaze of southern domestic tourists who went to Jaffna, a post-war destination. We selected a distinct data, actually trip data, and we identified a particular time period within which to collect the data. And we also justified why this sample, why this particular data source, why this particular time period for the editors or the relievers here. And we know Jaffna is a 
district within which there are many tourist destinations. Now the complexity is, what are we going to observe there? Or what are we going to analyze there? What is our unit of analysis? What is our context here? Actually the post-war, post-war is the context here, but the unit of analysis, unit of observations are different because we were visiting 13 tourist attractions there and we were monitoring different phenomena or activities which are taking place within this post-war context. When it comes to the case study research design, we can pick it up. And another paper is about Buddhist gaze and power in a post-war destination, a case study of Jaffna. Actually, here we have four main case studies. One is about the Hasalakagamini. The second one is about Nagadipa. The third one is about Nalur. The fourth one is about maybe Jaffna Market, as I remember. Or oh, maybe the, uh, sorry, the Delft. Fourth one is the Delft, right? So four cases were identified, but with the support of the theory, we happen to, uh, to predetermine what we are going to observe. So before going into the field for the data collection, you need to have a clear cut framework, your research design, your objective, and what you are going to observe there, what you're going to question. That is the point of a case study. And here, another paper, the research on intangible ethnic tourism development after a civil war based on stakeholders' perspective, the case of Jaffna. Actually, this is a part of my uh, a book which I authored about the intangible uh, heritage uh, of Hindu, Hindu culture. And uh, uh, where we made many visits to Jaffna and we did not have a predetermined places to identify we have to see these intangible cultures, but we use different sampling methods, data collection methods, and we were able to collect some chunk of data, some rich data to conduct our study. Another case. Very recently, we published Tibet. The tour meets uh, meets the west. And some of my authors, Pian Pu is from Tibet, she's a Tibetan. Li Cheng is my actually PhD supervisor from China and the Jeffrey Wall is, uh, is a professor from Canada Waterloo University. And we got together and we made our visits, we collected the data, we identified Tibet as the case and we were paying attention to the sustainable tourism practices, some cases. And my PhD thesis, which is about post-war nationalistic tourism and its impacts, a study based in Japan, Sri Lanka, is also a big case. It's not one case, but rather it's a collection of cases to identify the nationalistic case. We have the nationalistic case. We have the nationalistic case. We, we can see the transition of case and everything. And all these papers were published at top index journals, Web of Science, SSEI journals, right? Actually, tourism management perspective, and is a, this one, tourism review, uh, A-star journals in the field of tourism. And we got very good comments about our cases that we highlighted. So what is the success about these cases? So what is it about making a successful case study investigation? And in my case, particularly, I'm very much fond of the case studies, because the case studies allow you to make an in-depth investigation on a phenomenon. It will not restrict you with some statistical references or static or some samples, or maybe with your p-values, no. It is all about you, because you go to the field, you go to this particular context, and you believe this is important for us. So. You do the investigation, in-depth investigation, observations, and then you come to the conclusions. And here, especially in the case studies, I, I because my area is like peace and the reconciliation and the post-war uh, tourism development, right? Some uh, some disasters uh, uh, 
some disastrous areas. Yes, as uh, Professor Manohari mentioned. So I like grabbing or diving into or the plunge into the research context to identify some gems, some pieces of data, right, which haven't grabbed the attention of the academia. Still, for me, Jaffna is a kind of a nourishing ground and studies because because of this three decades long war, many things got changed, got preserved, got destroyed, and people suffered, people died, people sacrificed, many things happened. So in such cases, in-depth investigations are a must. And I know most of you are from the social science stream. And in the social science, we have to study the human behavior, how they think, how they behave, how they act, and we might have to forecast their future acts. So in that case, we have to answer some questions like what, why, how, when. So when answered in all those, in order to answer all those questions, the best solution or the best approach comes through the qualitative research and particularly with the case studies. As I earlier mentioned, what constitutes a case is disputed. Different scholars have different opinions about it. And as a case is an instance, incident, or unit of something and can be anything, a person, an organization, an event, a decision, an action, a location like a neighborhood or a nation state, we can consider country as a case. We can consider the, the last night match in between these two countries, the FIFA match as a case, yes, we can do that. We can go to that level, or we can we can also go to the roadside book, uh, a small shop or hotel, and consider it as a case as well. So there is no scope in the case. It is all about how how you pursue it, how you bound it, how you justify it, and how you interpret it. And the Swanbo explained that cases can be located at the micro, meso, or macro levels and involve one actor or multiple actors. So you can pay attention to one incident, one person, or many incidents, many persons, or even artifacts. If you come to Anuradhapura or Palu, there are many artifacts starting from the Samadhi statue, Akwanu statue. You can take it as a case as well. I have also seen at some academic establishments, including my own university, students are sometimes not allowed to do case studies. They think it is not sufficient. It's not strong enough to make a case. No, no, it is not like that. Even I have seen at the master's level, even the PhD level, level the case studies are not allowed, not by law, but the practice. Actually, totally depend on extend the researcher can dig dive into this research context. If they are going to consider only the manifest content, what are on the surface, well, I would agree with you, we should not allow that, allow the students to go for the case studies. But if it involves with the later content, where you are going to consider about the information, the underneath information, what is hidden behind, well, that need to be accepted. So we cannot, as qualitative researchers, we cannot restrict the students doing some kind of qualitative research, not the case studies, because the case studies are also having the equal weight like any other qualitative methods. And a case can be a case decision and during the Cost of the research. You you have kind of phenomena. You go to a maybe goal, then you are going to collect some data, and then you understand, okay, this is actually has happened, not what I thought. It is possible. This is a scientific inquiry. What you see is the surface. You just hear a news about some social event and you go there and you study, you, you live there. Basically, you are going to follow an ethnographic research in there, some phenomenological research. After spending some time with the villagers there, 
or with the with the, with the people there, you will understand. Okay, this is what I have to study. The case when we are going to do the case studies, sometimes it will take a little time for you to observe the key data pieces, key variables. That is what. That is why we always ask the question: What has happened? Why it has happened? How it has ha happened? Etc. Alternatively, the case can be treated as a general or given, like individuals, families, households, cities, years, and independent of any particular investigation. When it comes to the cases, there are two things you have to understand. The, the, the case can be understood as an empirical unit, also as a theoretical construct. In the what I meant by the empirical unit is that it is there. It is there in the society. It is there in the village or in the city. And you can see it. You can see its feature. You can see some symptoms. But if it is a theoretical construct, the case is basically made by the researchers by referring to the theories. You identify a theoretical gap and then you make it a theory. So it might not be available out there practical. So it is like hypothetical. It's a theoretical construct. So what is case is found? What is what do you what do you mean by what do you mean by found? It is real, bounded, social entities are included, the specific natural phenomena identified in the course of the research. It is made may be about a parahara. It may be about some some uh, some in incident, maybe Kirikoraha. You found the thing, you can see it. And again, empirically real and bounded, but given and general, generally it is there, you can see it. But it is the second one, theoretical construct, it is made a specific theoretical construct imposed on the empirical evidence as the research progresses. At the very beginning, we cannot see the empirical evidences, but, but we can hypothesize it. We can make a proposition out of it. Then we go to the field with the intention of our case study and to identify the evidences. So it is made, we, the researcher has to make it. And then we have the convention. The case is aligned with the general theoretical construct that is product of prior scholarly work and thus external to any particular research effort, right? You refer to the literature, previous literature before going into the cases, right? And then with the light of the literature, you will be able to construct your case under the theoretical construct. I hope I'm clear. So what really is a case study? A case study is a research approach that is used to generate an in-depth, multifaceted understanding of a complex issue in its real life context. And it also investigates contemporary phenomena of the case in depth and within its real world context, especially when the boundaries between phenomena and the context may not be clearly evident. So as the researchers, it is our responsibility to step into such scenarios where the boundaries are not clear, when it, if it is blurred, if it is dark, right? We have to step in and we have to shed light as the academia. So addressing the traditional concerns about the case study research. Is it rigorous enough? Sometimes people are, sometimes even our academics, we, we, we tend to ask the question, is it strong enough? Is it really make a case study? Is this researcher, can he do it? Is he kind of sloppy? He's not organized and he cannot do it. He doesn't have that analytical skills. Yes. That's it. So as researchers, we have, we have a bigger role to play. I the students towards an in-depth analysis, in-depth inquiry of the case he or she identified. And in the, in the case studies, there's no systematic procedure. Sometimes you can, you can have the about the research problem you are going to solve, and then you go to the field, you collect the data. You can conduct a couple of uh, random interviews with some spontaneous uh, people, right? Some random guys, yes, to get about the case there. What has happened, right? You identify, okay, somewhere the problem, okay, people are protecting, people are shouting, making 
have trouble, right? Yeah. Hello. What happened? I think Dr. Uh, Manoj, I think there is a connection issue. Uh, sorry, I think I got uh, just got disconnected. No, and it's okay now. Yes, sir. now it's okay. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right. right. Can you see this screen again? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, wait, sir. I think I shared something else. All right. Okay, sir. Yes. Right. Perfect. Thank you. So it it's about they're asking the question: Is it rigorous enough? And is this student will be able to go to that level? Their traditional concerns. That's true. And sometimes a confusion with the teaching cases. Because when we are reading a textbook, we can see the case studies, a small, small cases. That is not the case study we are looking at at this level. It is for study purposes. The student can take reading materials. And then generalizing from case studies, is it possible? Well, I would not recommend that. We cannot generalize the case study because this is a case. This is about Jaffna. I cannot... I cannot generalize the, 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 the Jaffna findings into Botswana or maybe to Croatia or maybe to Lithuania. No, I cannot. It applies to Jaffna only, but we should be able to generalize the findings into the theory. That is important in the case studies. In statistical world, yes, you can generalize into the population, but in the qualitative context, you are doing a case study, you cannot generalize into the population, but you can generalize it into the theory. And sometimes unmanageable level of effort. When you are stepping into the case studies, we do not know the boundary. When we conduct more and more, we just we do investigations, more interviews, so you will, you, you might. It might take too long compared to a quantitative study. It's not. It's and the high level of say you take an interview transcript an interview conducted with the village headman of the village and it will come in 10 to 15 pages and the transcribing process will take three to four hours it is time consuming yes so this uh, uh, these reasons actually discourage the scholars doing the case studies and now we come to the next uh, small topic, how should I select the case for my case study, case or cases? You need to sufficient access to the data for your potential case, that is number one. Sometimes people, our students, our academics, we, we start collecting the data without, without uh, understanding whether you are able to access to the data. And one of the students recently do a very good study about the LGBT tourists. LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgenders, the LGBT tourists. And I asked this simple question, okay, it's a wonderful uh, yeah, uh, He had a wonderful gap as well. I asked, how are you going to teach those tourists? Are you going to ask each and every one of them? Are you going to LGBT? Are you part of 
no you cannot it's hard it's hard and and then she suggested okay so i will get the information from the hotel managers <laughs> oh my god uh, is the hotel manager going to peep into the room no oh uh, are the tourists writing that in their registration uh, form check-in forms no and it is a kind of a question that the hotel hoteliers and the hotel professionals do not ask from the tourists no so we happen to change the topic and decide whether to interview people, review documents or records, or make field observations before selecting the case. We need to, right? Are you capable? The people simply blindly select the, the cases of they are here and some other places and they haven't even been there. No, if you're going to do a case study, you should have been there. You should know the context there. You should have some contacts there at least right that is one thing and second thing you should have the access to the data some documents policies books something you need to have them because now here we are doing a game with the information about this particular case a game with the data right and that cannot be collected through the five uh, five point record scale or the seven point record scale and given such access to more than a single candidate case, you should choose the cases that will most likely illuminate your research question. And absent such access, you should consider changing your research question, hopefully leading to new candidates to which you do have case, right? If you do not have that uh, access. So any questions so far? Because I have six main uh, sir. Uh, Skip, sir. My yes. name is Pushpade, sir. Uh, I'm doing a master's in Colombo University. Yeah. Uh, my, my research text, uh, topic is an analysis of potential development potential and prospect for rural sir, tourism, sir. Rural? Tourism in Sri Lanka, sir. Okay. If I choose the some case study, uh, yeah, should be in the beach or sand. The yes. village. Well, uh, if you if you want to select Jaffna, if you want to select Mulatiu, if if you are going to select a particular village or city, yes, I think sir, Nigambo, I can, I will select sir, Nigambo. Yeah, that is up to you, but you need to justify it at the your interview panel, your Viva panel. Right, you need to discuss with your supervisor as well. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Right. Another one more question. Samir, yes. Uh, uh, hello, thank you very much, sir. Um, like, uh, can you hear me, sir, clearly? Yes, Samir. Yeah, uh, I'm asking, sir, like, uh, what kind of desired skills or values, particularly uh, like a case study researcher should have? Is there any particular uh, values or desired skills very good very good samira uh, very good question what type of uh, values skills that you should possess actually for me if, if you are going to be a case uh, a researcher going to do uh, case studies you should be curious that is number one you should have this academic curiosity to explore the new things to shed light on new things and to be satisfied with it that is number one. And number two, this is not in the proper order, but the order that comes to my mind. Number two, you should be able to adapt to the local context, accept the local context, and acknowledge the local context, especially in the case study, local or whatever the case study context, because we are going to step into different research contexts. If you go to Vaunia, there's a way you should behave or you are expected to behave. If you go to Srima Bodhi, there is a way you are expected to behave. If you are good, if you are visiting the, the Madhupalya, there is a way you are expected to behave. So you should be able to acknowledge that, accept that. That's important. And number three, if you are doing a case study, you should have a kind of good uh, kind of PR, right? Personal relationship. You should be able to build some strong relationships with your respondents because you're going to get the data 
through the interviews. So before asking the questions, you need to establish a relationship with your respondent. So how are you going to do that? You cannot simply introduce yourself saying, I'm so-and-so from so that and this university, um, this is my research and please give me the answers. No, they will not. You must make them feel relaxed, open, especially if you're going to do an investigation or a kind of a sensitive um, um, research problem, it is important. And again, number four, your critical thinking. Critical thinking is important when you observe what kind of a phenomena. You go to Kandy, Daradam Maligava, you see the Tevava there, and there you need to interpret the Tevava, how it is happening, why it is happening. So you should be you should be able to ask the questions from yourself, why and why and why, why and why, five times. Then only you will get into the real answer. What has happened and why it is happening. And importantly, another I, at the beginning also I told you the interpretivism is important. The research approach, how well you can interpret the things, and because in qualitative research, unlike the quantitative research, it is totally based on your imagination, your critical thinking, and your academic discussions with by yourselves. You, you read, you think, you argue with yourselves, and then you come to the conclusion. So it is totally up to you. So there are very many qualities are, that are expected of a qualitative researcher. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, now we are in bed. So when to use a case study and when not to use a case study? How do I know? I should use the case study method. Sometimes people get stagnated. People, it's okay. Is it going to be a case study or is it going to be something else? What? There's no formula. We cannot draw a line saying that, okay, these studies need to be conducted using the case studies and these should be experimental. The others should be surveys. There's no such formula. It also, it is very subjective. It is also depend on how well you can justify your case. Rumesh, uh, yeah, please stop that. Thank you. And your research questions, the more that your questions seek to explain some present circumstances, like how or why, the more that case study research will be relevant. Now, in, in, a, in a case study, if you are going to investigate something new and you 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 are not going to ask the questions about how many or what to which extent no but some general questions like how and why and that has not been addressed before in that case you have to do the case study if before then you then, uh, then, then you can see the variables, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the, the diamonds, then you can see the right, which will lead you to do a quantitative study. So basically, in an area where less studies have been conducted, you have to conduct the case studies. And the method also is relevant. The more your question require an extensive description of some social phenomenon. And sometimes we cannot give a kind of a statistical value to to an incident now my 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 uh, popular example is that suppose you're a school teacher and you work at a school where there are 5000 number of school students and one day you find an empty liquor bottle just one so you take it to the principal and you show it to the principal saying that okay sir i found this and principal is very good in maths he has done a degree in kind of maths or maybe statistics so he make a little calculation okay now it is a um, one divided by 5,000 and multiplied by 100, he, he'll make a kind of a assumption, okay, so the, um, so this is like 0 0.000 kind of a, kind of, kind of a, a, a thing you have just identified with the li empty liquor bottle. So if you're going to give a statistical value to such a case, right, using percentages, well, no, you're failed. 
Having found an empty liquor bottle at a school is much more critical. So you need to pay your particular attention to that, right? Your careful attention to that, your individual attention to that. Similarly, in a baker, in a, in a, uh, you buy a bread and you find a cockroach in a loaf of bread and you complain it to the mudalali and the mudalali says, no, madam, per day we bake 10,000 bread and you are complaining about one. So the statistical significance is like again 0 0.4 four zeros and one. It is not significant, we are saying. Well, in, in, in qualitative research, we pay attention to these key incidents, critical incidents, right? Where statistically you cannot render. So in that case also, you can use the case study method. And the other thing, field of use, where we can use the case studies for the psychology, sociology, political science, anthropology, social work, business, education, nursing, and community planning, many fields you can use the case study approach. And especially I can see a large number of uh, uh, studies which were uh, conducted on psychology and the medicine, the cases, and decide to understand the social phenomena. If you want to understand some complex social phenomena, say you want to understand the religious practices at Nalur Kovil, during the July and August uh, the festival season. You have to go there at three in the morning and see how the people are worshiping or paying their respect to Lord Muruga, right? So in depth or oh, complex social phenomena are there. Many things are happening, but we cannot give a statistical value. And every research method can be used for all three purposes, exploratory, descriptive, and explanatory studies. And you, in your case studies, how we are going to do that? So there are explanatory or casual case studies, and there are descriptive case studies and exploratory case studies. So that need to be decided at the very beginning, whether it's explanatory, descriptive, or exploratory. Because according to the nature of the study, you have to have different data collection methods, analysis methods and different frameworks to work on. And basically the explanatory case studies, we aim to answer the questions like how or why? How or why? For example, an investigation into the reasons of Sri Lankan Aragalia 2022, we had a big issue. We are asking why it happened, why it happened and how it happened. That is explanatory. That is explanatory. So what is descriptive then? Impact of increased fragging on student academic, impact of increased fragging on students' academic performance, a case study of Sri Lankan State University. That is kind of descriptive because we are not going to ask the questions like how or why, but we are going to check the impact here. In the descriptive case studies, the aim is to analyze the sequence of interpersonal events after a certain amount of time has passed. The studies in business research belonging to this category usually describe culture, subculture, and the attempt to discover the key phenomena, business research as well. And also we can take the educational research. We can consider some time periods. For example, the first year we know the student's academic performance is low, but when it comes to the second year, second semester, they pick up, third year good, and fourth year maximum. Right, so then we can do a kind of a descriptive case study like how this fragging thing impact on the student's academic performance. And then we come to the exploratory case studies. It is aimed to find answers to the questions like what or who, what has happened and who has done it or where it has happened. An exploratory case study data collection method is often accompanied by additional data collection methods such as interviews, questionnaires, experiments, et cetera. And you can, you can have many data collection methods. I have just mentioned a few. Now here, another example, a study into differences of leadership practices between private and public sector organizations in Sri Lanka. That is an exploratory research study. So once you have a research problem, you need to identify whether it's an explanatory case study descriptive case study or exploratory case study. And that you need to justify at the introduction as well. Let it be a journal article or let it be a dissertation. 
Then the reviewers, then the examiners know, okay, the students know something. And he has clearly mentioned, okay, this is this type of a case study. Then he also set his mindset to evaluate your paper or as a dissertation accordingly. So types of research questions, who, what, where, how, and why questions, mostly we find in the case study research. And if research questions focus mainly on what questions, there could be two possibilities when it comes to the question what. Number one, some types of what questions are exploratory, such as what can be learned from a study of a startup business? What can be learned? Number two, what represent like how many, some quantifiable answers or how much? What, right, line of inquiry. And what have you been the what have been the ways that communities have assimilated new immigrants? Okay, we can consider Colombo or we can consider Perth, Australia. They are receiving so many immigrants. So in that case, the the countable numbers will appear. So what has two dimensions? And similar, like. The second type of what question, who and where questions are likely to favor the survey method. We have the statistics coming in again. Who and where questions, right? Who came, where it happened, and how many again, right? Or the analysis of archival data as in economic studies. We can look into our the economic policies and the growth rates, right? We ask the question, what has happened? What has been up there? The inflation rate. What has what has been the our the the, the results for in currencies, right? You can cover such questions as well. But basically, the how and why are more into the uh, exploratory. It will allow you to go into this in depth analysis. Whereas the questions like what, who, where are like you are touching the surface, right? And then you analyze it by looking at the data that you see at hand. And however, a questions are more explanatory and likely to read the use of a case study history or experiment as the preferred research method. So tell me, what best suits your study? What, if, you, if there are like a master's or PhD students, have you considered about these questions like what, who, where, how, and why? Yes. Okay. If you can slightly explain that. Uh, in my uh, MSc thesis, like uh, uh, I'm going to examine the how and why questions because the according to the Robert K. Ian, he's the one of the main pioneer case studies in Europe. Like uh, he explained uh, when you use the questions like uh, like you mentioned how and why then it is best to use the holistic uh, single case study. All right. Okay. 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 And what's your research area? Uh, my research area in the field of uh, human rights. Right. Okay, Samira. Thank you. Right. Anyone else considering how, what, why, where? I like to discuss because this should not be a, a lecture. If you have anything, right, okay, we can proceed. Uh, there's a question uh, in the chat box. Uh, if you take a person as a case, is there a recommended number of cases if it is a doctoral research? In the PhD level, uh, well, uh, I, I, uh, I cannot give you the exact answer here because I don't see your research problem, right? And uh, basically, with one case, it is hard. You cannot do a doctoral level research, even in the medicine, say, even not, right? Say, you, you can, uh, say, in the med medicine, that a doctor might find a mutant with some different features, different organ or kind of a thing or different performance, but still, it is not sufficient. You need to uh, have a, a pool of respondents and then you keep on collecting data till you reach the saturation. So data saturation, you can write it down. It is the point where there is no new data is emerging. We also have the theoretical saturation, which means that you collect the data till you 
uh, reach a theory. Right. Number three, the third section, identifying a strong case of designing case studies. So when it comes to designing a case study, just like any other conventional case study, there are a few things you need to consider. There, in the research design, basically what we concern, what we pay attention is where you are now and where you should be and, where is, how, and there's a big gap and how you are going to fill this gap. Right. So you have the research problem and you need to have an answer. OK, you look at the answer, the hypothetical answer. Right. And then you have some steps to make. So it includes your data collection method, your methodology, your analysis, your kind of some literature contributions, so on and so forth. So in case study, you need to plan it out at the very beginning. And another way of thinking about research design is as a blueprint. So when you are designing it, you need to have a kind of a blueprint. Right. This is what you should be following because in social science research, you could research, you could easily get distracted. You could easily get distracted because you are going to open yourself into a big, a huge pool of data, a huge pool of data, and you could easily get distracted. So you need to write it down, mention somewhere very clearly, if possible, paste it in front of your working desk. So you are looking at, okay, this is my scope and this is the level I should be going, right? And this is how you're going to reach it. That need to be done. And again, when it comes to the case studies, if you have like, sometimes if it is a master level or a PhD level, you have to do a couple of case studies to reach your research objective. Even in my master's thesis, I did many case studies, right? And they were presented separately. And each, then I happened to mention, what is my research objective? And through which case study I'm going to reach it and what methodologies I'm going to implement for the data collection, analysis and everything. So you need to go to that level. Then it is very clear that that will be your blueprint, which you need to be printed in your work. For your research dealing with at least four problems, what questions to study, what data are relevant, what data to collect, and how to analyze the results. And let's think about how to uh, design the case study. So basically, when designing the case study, at the very beginning, before collecting the data, you need to have uh, some sets, some protocols. Number one, you should have a case study question. One, one question or a couple of questions. And number two, it's propositions. In qualitative research, we do not have hypothesis, but we have research propositions. Number three, we should have a unit of analysis. How we are going to analyze it, right? And what we are paying attention, what are our observable contents, our unit of analysis. And number four, the logic link in the data to the proposition, how we are going to to combine it because proposition is kind of a again a kind of a hypothesis but before theory jumping in right constructively we just postulate and at some point you have to prove whether your proposition is correct or not descriptively you have to write without taking the statistics without taking the p-values and number five, the criteria for interpreting the findings. So these questions or these five components are very much important when you are designing a case study. So the case study questions, number one, the who, what, where, how, and why, we discuss about it, provides an important clue regarding the most relevant research method to be used. And the case study research is most likely to be appropriate for how and why questions only right? What, who, where are some other areas? So your initial task is to clarify precisely the nature of your study questions in this regard, right? You need to have a very clear idea what you are going to reach. And then you discuss with the supervisor and then you set your path, you make your blueprint. So case study question is number one. And according to the question, the method will get changed just like the how and the case studies is mostly, most likely to be appropriate for how and why, as I told you. And the other methods are different. Other questions have other methods. And second, if you have propositions, as for the second component, each proposition direct attention, 
directs attention to something that should be examined within the scope of the study and developed with the support of the theory. So what is the research proposition? It is a statement about the concepts that may be judged as true or false if it refers to observable phenomena. When a proposition is formulated from empirical testing, it is called a hypothesis. So uh, the first step, actually one step before forming the hypothesis is the proposition building. In qualitative research, actually in qualitative research, we deal with some data there where uh, no statistical or no scientific inquiries have been already conducted. We are going to touch some unexplored areas. No variables, no indicators, no items. Then what you should be having, you can have a proposition. You believe, okay, this is how it should be. This is how it will be. And then you try to prove that. Once you reach your proposition with the support of the theory, well, from there onwards, you can go for maybe exploratory factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis, and develop some scales to propose your hypothesis or to, to prove your hypothesis. So proposition is number one. And then the unit of analysis, very important. When you're going to study a social phenomena, what is your unit of analysis? Is it your, is it people? Is it processes? Is it organizations? Is it artifacts? Or is it a perahara? Or is it in is it an agricultural activity like harvesting, boyan kapima? What is your unit of analysis? You need to identify that. And in defining the case, for instance, the classic case studies, you should focus on an individual person as the case, one of the cases in person. So a case can also be a group. Uh, communities, decisions, programs, so organizational change and specific events. Even Sri Lankan constitution can be considered as a case. You can study that. And similarly, you might at first identify a specific local, such as a city as your case, or maybe a person as your case. If you're going into a uh, research uh, area, research problem where there are absolutely no previous studies, the, and again, you do not know, who your respondents are. And even in that case, you have to find some key informants, right? Before, and with their help only, you can go for the unit of analysis to identify the unit of analysis. However, your research questions and data collection, collection might in fact be limited to tourism in the city, city policies or city government. If it is like, if you do a research, research is about tourism. And you are going to do a research about the urban tourism, right? So city, city policies, city government, what, what are you going to analyze? Oh, and again, remember, you can have many units of analysis. We will come to that later. We call it the data triangulation. Under data triangulation, you can do that. And these choices would differ from defining the geographic city and its population as your case. And as a general guide, the tentative definition of your case is related to the way you define your initial research questions. Even at the very beginning, I told you, you need to have your own definitions. Actually in research, we can call it the working definition. By a case, what, what do you mean by a case? What do you mean by a phenomena? What do you mean by a, some social constructs? You have to give the clear idea to the reviewers. To your examiners, then they will find it easy to go through the or follow your the report. And most researchers will want to compare the findings with the previous research. It is important, right? What happened in Sri Lanka, what happened in India, what happened in Indonesia, or maybe Bahrain, or maybe in United States, right? How the what is the behavior of the Sri Lankan unit of analysis? There are some people, right? And how how the people in, in India accepted it, or maybe they're responding to it. Look at a cricket match. Our unit of analysis could be our, uh, our audience, Prekshakyo, right? All these people. So how they respond to the cricket match? We can have a cross-sectional case study across the world or across the South Asia. How the Sri Lankan cricketers behave, how the Indian cricketers behave, how the Pakistan cricketers behave. And then it is important that you link data to your propositions. Now see, when we are conducting the qualitative research, uh, uh, mostly my, uh, our students, our colleagues are also asking, in qualitative research, what you are going to show with respect to the research problem? 
how to give it, how to present it. Oh, uh, can I simply write like 50 pages? No, 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 you're wrong. You cannot do that. What you have to do is that you need to justify or you need to clearly identify the key features of your case. Key features, just like the tree. Now look at this tree. It has a trunk. It has fruits, it has branches, it has a twig, it has leaves, it has, it has flowers, and it has root, right, barks, everything. So these are the features of the tree. Just like that, you need to justify, you need to identify and justify the features of your case. Say, you are going to explain the behavior of some, some, some culture, the people, how they behave in a, in a particular community, a rural community. What you have to talk. You, you have a general objective of exploring their culture, distinct culture. They are in a kind of a, a middle of a jungle, kind of a thing, remote, remote, some remote village. So, in that case, what are the main features? You have to observe their maybe marriage traditions, funeral traditions, whatever, right? Their food, their clothes, their this and that behavior, right? You need to identify these small, small behaviors, right? Maybe their investments too. If they, if they are, are they still into barter economy or are they using the currency, right? You need to divide or split these things into smaller, smaller segments. And then only you can go for a descriptive analysis, which can be ultimately combined with the research propositions, right? Now look at this case, right? Now this was adapted from Yin 2017, one of the, uh, from the leading academics on uh, case studies. Now these are, the individuals are more concrete. We can look at the behavior of these people, we can interview them, we can question them, and we can give some concrete findings. You can do a kind of an observation, focus group discussion about small group with small groups, and then you can put forward the findings. You can look at some, organizations look at their annual reports and give you observations or oh, you can look at the partnerships in between two companies they assign an mou and thereafter product goes up technology transfers and staff transfers you can you can talk about it it's more concrete you can see it but now these are different phenomena some contexts which are less concrete community for example it has it could have maybe 10 houses or maybe 500 houses it's a community, a small or big community, and their behavior, it's kind of complex. And the relationship that you have in between the mother and the baby, what type of a relationship is that? How you are going to define it? How you are going to exploit? Is it, you can, can you, can you give a value? Or can you just observe, uh, observe it and give some values just like you did with the small groups? No, it is hard sometimes. So case studies are not always easy. It is not always easy. You have to identify the bond between the, between the husband and the wife, or maybe the rivalry between two enemies, right? In India, they, they have some villages, some cities, they fight over the water. And it has been kind of lengthy fight, like lengthy in the sense they, they, the, the, the history goes back to some decades, right? So it is lot less concrete. There are no concrete evidences to identify such phenomena. And the decisions, how you're going to make it and how, even how you uh, made decisions, what helped you to make decisions. The import and the projects, less concrete because they keep on changing. Number five, then we come to the criteria for interpreting a case studies finding. We need to hear Identify and address rival explanation for your finding. Rival explanation. In case studies, we need to present our data, our findings in comparative terms. I told you, it is not only about Jaffna we are speaking, but also about Iraq you need to talk, but also about Baghdad, about maybe Seoul in Korea. It was a boring destination once, right? Or maybe some other places like Jerusalem. Some alternative theories are there, alternative contexts are there. You need to get the support from those cases and explain it here. 
explain it with the Sri Lankan case. And addressing such private becomes a criterion for interpreting your findings. And the more rivals that have been addressed and rejected, the stronger will be your findings. Say, you take many, many, many cases or the observations from tribal cases in other post-war destinations. From other post-war destinations, you get a lot of findings, but uh, then you check whether you have the same thing in Jaffna. Okay, you make a list, 10, you say, yes, 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 yes. So there's nothing novel, there's nothing new here, right? But if you can find some one, two, three, four pieces of some distinct features, right? Which is, which is available only in Sri Lanka compared to all other case studies, well, that is a gem. That is what you should need to be looking at. And at the design stage of your work, the challenge is to enumerate the important rivals, important rivals, so you will include data about them as part of your data collection, right? You need to take the cases, you need to learn from alternative uh, cases, right? And then you make your questionnaires, interview questionnaires, right? And maybe the survey data, then it will, the process will be much easier. And if you only think of tribal explanations after data collection has been completed, you will be starting to justify and design a future study. But you will not be able to help, not be helping to complete your current case study. There could be occasions, right? Okay, once you get into some data, okay, your time has lapsed, right? And you have to submit something. So maybe perhaps next time you have to do something. Actually, after conducting the master's research, PhD research, you will, you will get the real knowledge. My goodness, I should have done it in this way, the other way, right? I, I, there are so many issues. Even after, after three years after completion of my PhD, now I'm reading my, I still see some issues. I, I could have done better. Because over the time, we get the knowledge, we get more wisdom. And for this reason, specifying important rival explanations is also part of case study research design work. So what we try, what we should try is to get the support of the previous literature as much as possible. Try to get some similar cases, which has happened somewhere else in the world, get their features, get their unit of analysis. Try to do the repetitions here, if possible. And then, you need to go for the new thing, the knob things, right? Right. Okay. Now, when it comes to the statistics, it is the acceptance or the rejection, the likelihood, values, but in qualitative research, you need to justify the acceptance or the rejection in big pages, maybe 10, 20, 30 pages with different materials with different references, with different cases. Why this particular is important? Why this finding is important? How it is to other cases? How it is different from other cases? You need to explain that very well. Right, now this is important. This is the case study research design. Uh, this was uh, from the Cosmos uh, Corporation, 2014. They invented this model. Again, the principal uh, author was uh, Yin. Uh, now, we can have single case study, sorry, single case design and single unit of analysis. So you have the context and you have the case. I'll come to this. Uh, now, say, you want to observe the behavior of the tourists visiting Jaffna. I, I think I have some other explanation. Yeah, I'll come, there. I'll, I'll, I'll come to the example later. So the first research design is you have the single case and the single unit of analysis, which is very easy, which is very convenient and very popular for the undergraduates. And the second thing is that you can have multiple cases, which means now here we can have one city, one village, one community. That is your single, that is your case, right? But here, maybe four villages, four cities, multiple cases are there. But the unit of is the same. We'll come to it. And the third option is that we have the single case design. Case is same, but you can have multiple units of analysis. Or oh, the fourth 
scenario, multiple case, case design is there and we have the multiple unit of analysis here. And this is more complex. Actually, even in my PhD, I followed this particular method. You can have multiple case designs and you can have multiple unit of analysis. We'll come to them one by one. So single case or the context and the single unit. The single case can represent the critical test of significant theory. And the case represent an extreme case or an unusual case. So this is very much palpable in the, um, in, in the, in the psychology research in the medical research, single case, they look at the behavior of one particular patient, but in management research, no. In, in social science research, no. Perhaps you can take a religious leader and discuss about it, single case. Or maybe you can take a kind of a, a, a reputed uh, uh, literate, or maybe like some author, someone, right? The names doesn't come. So there, you pay attention to the single unit. Uh, specify injury or disorder, right? And here, we have to consider about the common case. Here, the objective is to capture and the circumstances and the conditions of an day situation. So one, one, we are paying attention to one particular case, one particular incident, one particular phenomena at one particular place right? We are not going to pay attention to the other places, other incidents. We also have the revelatory case. This situation exists when a researcher has an opportunity to observe and analyze a phenomenon previously inaccessible to social science inquiry. Revelatory, it is new, right? We just observe the new case, new one incident, and you are investigating on it. Number three, we can have the longitudinal case studying the same single case at two or more different points in time. Maybe before the budget and after the budget, the behavior of the government, or maybe the behavior of the uh, cricket fans before the cricket match and the, after the cricket match. One match, one cricket fan base, single case, single unit. It is clear. And the other example is that when it comes to my research, post war, the behavior of the uh, domestic tourists visiting Jaffna. So the context is the post war, and the case, case is the domestic tourists. They visit Jaffna, right? I'm not, I'm not considering, I'm not going to consider other post war destinations like Molotov. Or maybe Vaunia, no, just Jaffna, one. And again, I'm not going to consider the foreign tourists, only Jaffna, because why? Single unit of analysis. So, so remember, now when you are conducting new research, you need to identify whether it's going to be single unit or multiple units, or single case or multiple cases. Then we have the single case and multiple unit. Now, uh, this is where it is, single case and the multiple unit. Now, for example, still the, the now in this case, the context is similar. Still, but we are going to pay attention to the behavior of domestic and the foreign tourists. Earlier, one unit of analysis, only the domestic tourists, but the second scenario consider both domestic tourists and the foreign tourists, right? The evidence from multiple units is often considered more compelling and the overall study findings will have a greater validity. Because why? In the previous case, in the single case, sometimes the reviewers might ask why you haven't, you haven't considered the, the foreigners visiting here, they might have different opinions, etc. And the conduct of a multiple unit study will allow the researchers to cover a broad range of research contexts. And each unit must be carefully selected so that distinct behavior could be easily monitored, how the local tourists behave and how the foreign tourists behave, etc. Any questions about this? Other if you have anything, 
హలో సార్ హలో సార్ yes samir yaar oh my name is which push the dev yeah my problem statement is a uh, uh, lack of uh, rural tourism knowledge in the villages so can i turn to it to the the questions like uh, why they have that type uh, knowledge ah uh, pushpa dev that is the uh, yeah uh, this is not the correct platform to discuss about it perhaps later right but do you have any questions related to this single unit of analysis or the cases here so oh. okay so that's uh, the, the i have to analyze that the uh, problem statement uh, why they haven't that type knowledge uh, to the promote the, our rural tourism in sri lanka sir that, that is a uh, objective and uh, problems i want to turn out this as a questions all right perhaps we can talk uh, at the end of the session okay sir if okay, you have sir. any question regarding the cases you can ask right okay sir sandaru one uh, yes yeah actually my question is not exactly related to the the this, the, the four types of case study according to the in yeah. but uh, like uh, in qualitative research uh, such as the case study mm. do we need to situate our positionality in case study research if so when we like where is the place we should put our positionality in the case study research mm. right very good right uh, sandhuran when it comes to the our positionality there are actually uh, we need to again check with our institution according to our again with our supervisor whether it is allowed now in my cases i get the approval about to put my position in actually i believe that the researcher should have the freedom to mention it so what i would recommend it is that in methodology you can put forward your position then the reviewers will understand okay he has done the analysis having this position in mind right and that is the correct place or perhaps at the introduction you can simply or maybe in a, in a nutshell in maybe in couple of uh, maybe in one sentence you can mention about it but your positionality will uh, best suit at the methodology section but again you need to get the consent of the journal and maybe at the uh, supervisor because uh, some uh, schools are having different um, positions about that of course thank you very much sir thank you yeah uh, lasita miss yes, lasita sir. yes yeah. uh, sir this is uh, what my uh, question is now when we do it uh, now i am a uh, linguistic graduate and uh, i my question is whenever we go to do uh, study i mean case studies in uh, case study research in research in linguistics uh, sometimes yeah. uh, it is highly challenging the reason is we have to uh, sometimes interview a yeah. lot of things so then when we interview so sometimes they will not reveal most of the things sometimes they will reveal sometimes they will not reveal so how yeah, yeah. to now uh, for to uh, get rid of that uh, challenge we have to in, uh, interview many even though there are maybe things that they do not like to reveal or they will not reveal so that is a challenge i would like to uh, request uh, you to tell us how to get rid of that yeah. of challenge uh thank you lasita again an important question about this uh, missing pieces of the puzzle and it is not uh, restricted to the linguistic studies but also cross sectionally maybe into the social science anthropology and everywhere you can see this particular issue one of the main things that i can recommend and i would recommend to the scholars is that first you uh, you you develop a good bond with the respondents right you you sit with them you invite them for a coffee and that depends again with the context and whether they are like and there are many things i i have done a wonderful study about the beach boys and uh, first i and it is a kind of a sensitive data i wanted especially with respect to the the sexual transmitted diseases as well because i had another research partner from the ministry of health so uh, 
at the very beginning, I did not reveal my true intention. I approached them through uh, another friend who used to be a beach boy. So I went to these homes. I spent a couple of days with them. I went to the beach with them. I, I even spoke with the foreigners, right? Just playing the beach volleyball and everything. So I, I won their confidence over the time, maybe a couple of days later after a couple of rounds of beer. And then I slowly approached one by one. And then I... I, 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 I explained my true objective, why my, my being there, why I'm there, right? And then I was able to collect the data, all the required data within like three weeks time. But I don't think in the linguistic, you need such sensitive and in-depth data, but perhaps maybe with little, little activities, maybe with little, little uh, motivations, you know, maybe giving some gifts or kind of a thing, that is also a kind of a method that you can encourage the respondents to participate in the, actively participate in our discussions that is also recommended. And again, um, it is, uh, uh, and perhaps the interview environment, are you, whether you uh, conducted the interview in front of their parents or maybe in front of their lecturers or teachers, they might not reveal that as well, right? And maybe what type of a place and even the time, right? So there are a whole lot of things you have to consider when setting this interview uh, background. But I personally believe that if we have the right methodology, if we have the right approach, the data can be abstracted. You can, right? I have interviewed some uh, the rehabilitated uh, LTT carders, right? Some wonderful people. I have got some very sensitive data during my PhD tenure. I have been to many places and even I got some data against the Chinese government from the Chinese people, right, after being with them. So, uh, so researchers' approach need to be kind of customized according to the research problem and the context. That's my recommendation. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Right. Thank you, Rasita. Okay. So we discussed about the single case design and the multiple unit of analysis. Now let's talk about the multiple, multiple case design. Now in this case, we have, we are now here we spoke only about Jaffna, just one. Jaffna only the domestic tourists and here domestic tourists and the foreign tourists. But here, what are we going to do? We have the Jaffna, we have the Mulatu, we have the Vaunia and we have Mena. Right, and single unit of analysis, which means only the single is tourists. Domestic tourists are considered, not the single is, but the domestic tourists are your uh, uh, unit of analysis, right? So that is the third one. I will go to the explanation. So multiple cases and the single unit. The evidence from multiple cases is often considered more compelling and the overall study is therefore regarded as being more robust. And not all the phenomena could be studied through single cases. One case is not sufficient. Unusual or extreme cases, the critical case and the revelatory case are some exceptions, especially which have been used in the medical and the health and the psychology. But in social science, it is better that we have many multiple, or multiple cases. And the conduct of multiple case study can require extensive resource and the time beyond the means of a single student or independent research uh, research investigator. So in that case, because we know you go to Jaffna, it will take, uh, go to collect the data in Jaffna, it will take a couple of weeks. Then how about we sit in four places? It will take like months or maybe half of the year. It's time consuming, right? It's very costly. So we need to work in groups as well. So we need to have our boundary. Okay, how we are going to collect the data with whom we are going to collect the data and which to which extent are we going to go? We need to decide that during the research designing phase. And the each case must be carefully selected so that either predicts similar results and or predict uh, contrasting results, but for anticipatable reasons or theoretical replication. And the ability you can, you should be able to conduct like six to 10 cases as well. Now here, again, going back to my main slide here at the, uh, the, the Yin's models, you can have the Jaffna, Banas, Molotiv and Bomia. And here you will find some data are appearing, the same data may be appearing at all these four contexts. All these four contexts, the similarities you need to report important. And again, there could be differences, maybe limited to Vaunia, limited to Jaffna, 
limited to mana and limited to Kilinochi kind of a thing. Those data are important when it comes to multiple case and then single use of uh, unit of analysis. And finally, we come to the multiple cases and the multiple units. And then we will uh, further uh, discuss with a research paper. Now, multiple contexts and multiple units. Here, I told you the five districts you are visiting and not only the domestic tourists, but also the foreign tourists. The rationale for multiple case designs derives directly from your understanding of literal and theoretical replication. You go to the field with the support of the theory. You develop the questions with the support of the theory as well. And you have to ask the like same questions over and over across the cases you have selected. Because we need to have some similar data and different data, but you have to always keep an, uh, keep your eye on, on new data. And the simplest multiple case design would be the selection of two or more cases that are believed to be literal replications, such as set of cases with exemplary outcomes in relation to some evaluation question. And selecting such cases require a prior knowledge of the outcome with the multiple case inquiry focusing on how and why outcomes have occurred and hope for literal replication of these. So what are what are appearing and what are repeating need to be identified and what are the exclusives, the exemplaries need to be discussed separately. I'm going to open a, a paper in which we use this uh, multiple cases, multiple unit of analysis, just to discuss really quick. Right. Do you see the Buddhist in the screen? Can you see? Yes, we can see, sir. Right, okay. Now here, my uh, my my topic is Buddhist gaze. Now gaze is basically the visual consumption of the destination. Now context is the post for destination, but we are not going to limit it to the post uh, limit it to one particular destination, but many. Now let's see quickly what these destinations. Are. The study site is Chafna, Sri Lanka, but still. It is presented through different cases. The post for Buddhist travels in Sri Lanka, one case, so this is an incident. And Buddhism during the war, it is not geographical cases we identified. Some Google link, you can and then uh, uh, the ethnic scene by the TE and uh, some religious things and the four cases we identified the memorial of uh, Gamini Kularapna Nagadipa Purana Viharaya, number three, Dambakula Patuna Sangamita Temple, number four, Nag Vihara Temple, number five, Kadurgad Temple, number six, destroyed Buddhist Tupa. Okay, so this is a they were They were derived from the ethnic nationalism, uh, uh, that kind of concept about this uh, hegemony, about this, uh, you know, there are many uh, concepts in it. And uh, we descriptively described how uh, it was posted or presented. place. because religion had a bigger role in the, the unitary, the conceptual unitary state, not the conceptual, but it is the, the unitary state of Sri Lanka. We were discussing the cross-section and the destruction caused by the LTT and then also the destructions caused by the, uh, the Sri Lankan uh, army as well, right?
the community, how they think, how they viewed the post war scenarios, and again the polit politics at the Nagadeep and the Nagavihara temple. And the Sangha temple, right? We have been to all these places, Khadrugode. So multiple cases were studied here, again with multiple units of analysis. So this is a comprehensive study. Please read it to get an idea how on building a successful case study using multiple cases and multiple unit of analysis. And uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, share another document. I just shared you my, my PhD, thesis, PhD thesis. Yes, we can see that. Right. I'm going to take a uh, single page. Yeah, I'm going to show you my uh, actually, this is a 420 page report. I'm going to show you the uh, my table of content. Just give me a second. Continuous code in yeah. literature review and the research field. Uh, let's go to the data. All right, here. The research, now uh, my study, uh, I completed my study with different research propositions, uh, talking of, that were talking about the uh, ethnic nationalism and the civic nationalism peace and reconciliation and tourism development. So one of the case studies I adopted here was construction of ethno-religious nationalistic gaze during the first phase of post-war travels in Sri Lanka, especially after, uh, after 2009, why the Southern people went to Jaffna in search of what? So case study setting, background and design and procedure and the analysis, everything were presented here. And then we come, I come to the second case study, which can different unit of analysis, construction of civic nationalistic tourist guests during the second phase of post-war travel in Sri Lanka. And everything were uh, analyzed and discussed here. And then I come to the case study three, the ethnographic analysis of post-war post-guest interaction. Uh, especially we implemented, we conducted uh, auto-ethnography analysis based on uh, six train rides to Jaffna from Colombo. We were sitting with the people, observing, discussing with them, and again, traveling with them to different parts of Jaffna. So these are like multiple cases where we implemented multiple units of analysis. Thereafter, the findings were sent to the quantitative study for statistical so do you have any questions here Analysis, I mean, the what kind of inferential statistical analysis did you use in quantitative part in your PhD thesis, sir? Yeah, actually, we identified some key uh, research propositions. Later on, we converted into research hypotheses, which were, res which were respected to this uh, nationalism, right? and uh, with some sensitive data. And we wanted to develop a scale to show the relationship with the tourism. So we went for the scale development, exploratory factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis, and all these uh, traditional SPSS and the smart PLS analysis we conducted. And we came, uh, made some conclusions about to identify these relationships. Okay, sir. Right. Any other questions?
No, right. You can proceed. I'm going to share my presentation again. Uh, for autoethnographic data collection, how do we take ethical clearance? Well, uh, we have the ethical clearance committees at the faculty levels, at the university level. So you have to sub uh, produce a small proposal, submit them, explain why you need the, uh, the auto why you need this autoethnographic research and the importance of it and your unit of analysis. And I'm sure the ethic review committee will look into your inquiry. And in my case, uh, I applied to it uh, from the from my university, China Sichuan University, and I got the required clearings. But again, uh, we need to understand that different uh, countries are having different uh, criteria when it comes to giving ethical clearances for the researchers. Uh, for instance, uh, New Zealand, Australia are very, very critical about these uh, ethical clearances, and they are very, you know, concerned about the people's emo people's emotions and the feelings and the behaviors, and even about the photos. So it is from school to school and from research to context and country to country. So the, you can try your luck with uh, your particular university. Yeah, no way as well, yes. Uh, there's another question. Did you see like abductive approach? Actually, it doesn't come to my mind right now. I will try to answer it during the uh, session. Right. So now you tell me, now I know some of master's thesis and the PhD research and some of you are doing your own research, right, personally at the university. Which approaches are you using? And which you think best match for your study research problem? Is it possible to answer? Since no one else is answering, yes. Yeah, because I, I'm talking, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, in my case, uh, I have planned to use, uh, you know, a uh, multiple uh, like sorry a uh, single case study design the reason why i selected uh, single case study design as per the robert k and like you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, it is a uh, the 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 i'm going to examine in candy there is still expression mm -hmm. in that yeah so that is one of the reasons i selected a single case study design and uh, because the i like i have limited time as well therefore i selected a single case study to get the in depth anal in depth analysis uh, i am using a mixed method uh, along with the case study and your unit of analysis again single or multiple uh, single sir uh, it is so you are here right yeah yeah that yeah. is an easy approach most convenient but okay you are uh, okay at the master's level as long as to explain that elaboratively you have to explain in deep yeah right thank you sir anyone else doing some similar studies maybe with multiple cases multiple unit of can i just share some of my thoughts as well uh, yeah, I, i'm actually doing my phd on uh workplace bullying and tourism industry. I'm actually located in the Maldives uh, doing my PhD at PGIA. So I, I was like, I'm in an area where I'm like, like when studying, yeah. it's a main method. I have yeah. identified some of the propositions uh, where the labor process, the theory is labor process theory, like through where the capitalistic approach come and then like you guys, like workers are forced to do something. So through that approach, I'm I'm trying to identify why bullying can be a technique or something. Mm -hmm. So now uh, we 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 have some propositions, and now I am in a stage where I'm trying to explore the uh, 
why, why, what is happening, why this is happening in the tourism sector of the Maldives. And uh, I am trying to do embedded multiple analysis case study to different star categories of the results, like five star categories, six star categories, three star categories, and then trying to identify uh, organizational perspective as well. So, but, but I am trying to interview the individual uh, staff there. Like uh, we have different ethnographic racism, like because we are catering to the multi national i mean tourism area so i i am in a situation where i'm trying to identify the unit of analysis and we also have an agreement where we are trying to do multiple case design because it's a huge big area so once we are identified this proposition and then if we know what is actually what is exactly happening in the context of Moldavian tourism resort and then further we are going to do experimental so that we will identify the relationship between what is actually happening so it's kind of a mixed method uh, initially the analysis is on case study like multiple case design through the embedded so right. that i will know what is happening and then further uh, to confirm that i'm trying to do experimental well i'll be using relationship and then i can use some of the control measures where i but i get it from the cases session is really helpful thank you very much right uh, lisa thank you very much it's a very it was very nice to hear about your study and how we are going to get forward from the maldivian context and yes uh, agreed with you all your comments you seen the why multiple case and the why the i i just have thank one you, one qu uh, quick question okay is it uh like maybe it's not a question but can be debatable I'm interviewing uh, individuals in the resorts, uh, maybe from different departments like chefs, like accountants, the reception. Okay. So my unit of analysis will be the individuals, not the organization. Am I right? So I am confused. Well, uh, uh, without, without seeing your um, questionnaire, I cannot tell you whether it is the uh, multiple unit of analysis or the sorry, multiple or the single units. Because if you are going to ask totally different questions from the chefs and again from the reception boys, unit of analysis. But if if you are going to repeat the same questions from these different employees who are working at different parts of the hotel, then it is single unit of analysis. Okay, I think I'm clear. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, and uh, I have been. Uh, instructed by the organizers to give a, like, a break so it is uh three minutes after let's meet at uh, 11 because we need to wind up by 12 o'clock thank you stay with the uh,
Yes, we yes, can. yes, we can. Yeah. Right, perfect. So I hope you can see the screen as well. Now, uh, now we are going to discuss the fourth main point, the collecting the, the data and fifth and sixth, uh, there are uh, two or three more areas to go. So collecting the data for the case studies. Uh, before going out to collect the data, we need to get ourselves prepared. We need to prepare to collect the uh, case study data. But this preparation for data collection could be a little bit complex because we do not know which data to collect exactly. And again, we, uh, the, the, the depthness could be really deep, right? And the width could be really wide. So we need, how we, we need to have some guidelines, we need to have some protocols, what type of data we are going to collect and to which extent we should go. Because if you are going to keep on interweaving and interweaving and interweaving, you are going to collect a lots and lots of data. So you, you again need to think whether they are relevant to our study, my case, my unit of analysis, is it? And if not done well, the entire case study can be jeopardized. And all the early work in defining the research questions and designing the case study will have been for naught, right? So, they, so we need to make sure that we collect the right information and right type of information for our case study. So moreover, gaining approval for your case study, showing how human subjects will be protected can pose another challenge, for, especially in the, in the field of medicine. Health and medicine, if you're using the human organs, subjects, maybe photographs, right? That is kind of complex. So you need to have proper clearances for the ethical approvals from the ethics review committee of your university. So usually uh, a good preparation begin with the desired skills and the values on the part of the case study investigator. I think we addressed that question earlier. And we need to train for a specific case study, right? We need to sometimes focus uh, where you are going to place yourself, what type of people you are going to deal with and how to collect the data from them, right? We also had another uh, question that one of the participants asked because she hasn't been receiving some quality data. We need to prepare ourselves to get these unexpected data which they're not going to reveal to us. We need to have some strategies and developing a protocol for the study and screen the candidate cases. And perhaps sometimes the, your, your uh, data collection might be jeopardized if you have the wrong set of people, group to answer. They're not, they're not cooperating with you for some reasons. We don't know why. We need to identify that as well. And we can also think of conducting a pilot case study to identify whether this is going to be successful or not. So decide skills and values. I'm not going to spend much on this because we uh, discuss about it. Too many people are drawn to case study research because they believe it is easy, but it is not. Case studies are not easy because you have to plunge into the data, the dive into the data to identify the, the gems in the data. And then many social scientists, especially the budding ones, think case study research can be mastered without much difficulty. They believe that they only will have to learn minimum set of technical procedures like data collection, taking the photographs, you put it into the report and then you explain it. However, they forget to explain or they forget to answer the questions like why and how, which are very much important in the case studies. Why it is happening and how it is happening. So what? People are behaving in this way. Those people are fighting with the other people right and they're destroying each other's property something like that so what what will happen next where else it has happened you need to explain it with some concrete evidences with some cases that you abstracted from other research and that any of their own shortcomings formal analytical skills will be unimportant they think okay if you i mean in qualitative research, your limitation is your imagination, your thinking capacity. If you cannot see through a case, if you cannot see through a phenomena to understand what is behind there, what is lacking there, and what are supporting to make this thing happen, this phenomenon happen, right? You need to identify. That is, which is totally up to you because you are the person who's going to collect the data. And again, you think it as important, not me. It is not my study. It is you who think it, right? So it is again, subjective. And the case study will allow them to simply tell, tell it like it is. No, no beliefs could be farther from the truth. 
from the truth. So we have to be very careful about our skills and the values. And if you are like a lazy person, if you cannot think, I mean, not lazy, but if you, if, if you cannot focus the situation, if you cannot see through a situation and if you cannot adapt to the local context, be with them, live with them and behave like them. And thereafter only you can get the right data. But you cannot simply make one visit to or two visits to a research uh, site, right? Your case, your context. No, you cannot uh, get the data. That is not sufficient. You have to actually live there. At least mentally, you have to live there. And in actuality, the demand for the case study on your intellect, ego, and the emotions are far greater than those of any other research method. That is important. And am I ready to start collecting the case study data? So your readiness depend on your own skills level of doing the case studies, as well as you are having the completed formal and preparatory procedure prior to the collecting actual data, such as having properly selected the case to be studied, where you are going to study this case, right? So basically in the PhD research, we identify the theoretical gap. And then in order to fulfill theoretical gap, we look at the context where we are going to do it. Actually, we can, the, if it is a well constructed or clearly identified the, uh, identified theoretical gap, you can fulfill it either being in Sri Lanka or maybe being in Indonesia, right? The context is irrelevant. There could be significant, there could be different answers coming in, but that theoretical problem could be uh, or you, you, you should be able to apply it in other contexts as well. That is important. And the notice for distinguishing those persons likely to become good case study researcher from those who are not. We cannot do, we, can, we cannot just count or look at the uh, questionnaire and say, oh, you are going to be a wonderful researcher. No, that's again, de uh, depend on how well you are going to build your dialogue, earning the confidence, right? And bring on the discussion, develop it and get the information out of the respondent. And again, it is important that you ask good questions and interpret the answers fairly, right? What do you mean by good question? The good questions are, which are theoretically sound, empirically sound, and is, you should be able to get sound, develop your research or reach, you should be able to reach your the solution to your research problem, research questions through these questions. They are known as good questions and they, they will, good questions actually lay a, a kind of a ladders or steps to reach your objectives. And again, you need to be a good listener if you're going to be a qualitative researcher because the respondent is going to talk a lot. So you should be able to screen out, right, filter the information, and they will talk about all the things except the answer that you want, right? There could be occasion. So you need to take him back to the track. Okay, this is the path you have to run and get the data out of that and stay adaptive so that new encountered situations can be seen as opportunities, not threats, adaptive. There could be differences. You need to adapt it. You need to accept it, acknowledge it and go forward. And you need to have a firm grasp of the issue being studied even, uh, even when in an exploratory mode. Right. Uh, the research gap may be kind of theoretical gap, methodological gap, empirical gap, knowledge gap, and evidence gap. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But in the PhD level, basically, we are looking at the theoretical gap. Contribution, contributing to the other gaps is a part of the research process that you need to do. And even the master's level, if you are doing the kind of a basic research, you need to first identify the theoretical gap. And thereafter, you can, in your research, you can contribute your, as your potential contributions, you can say methodological advancement or empirical contributions like that. And then the respondents again from your university to document everything and keep it in your hand. The finalization of the plans cannot occur until after the approval has been granted. The training activities described below may therefore take place over an extended period of time, especially if you're working on a bigger research project, I mean, bigger than your master's, bigger than your PhD. You need to have some people working with you, working for you, right? And then you need to train them to get the expected deliverables. And uh, for case study research, the key to understand the needed training is to understand that every case study researcher must be able to operate as a 
senior researcher because because the interpretation is totally at your hand because you see the things and you believe it is important okay so you need to develop yourself and uh, you need to become an independent researcher in qualitative research and you need to make your own intelligent decisions throughout the data collection process right uh, yeah suhana thank you for the question but if if the time permits i will we can discuss about your question thank you right so this is uh, 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 this is my data collection somewhere in a corner of Jaffna, right? Going into the context, identifying my unit of analysis. Actually, we wanted to uh, get some information about how our uh, the senior Hindu people, they, they spend their rest of the life uh, in temples, right? So with the support of the uh, some data enumerators and the field assistant, we went there and they were uh, interpreting and collecting the data, right? And this is a kind of a, a complete participant uh, participant observation, you know, participant observations, right? We sit in the Nallur festival, uh, like in 2019 or 20, I cannot remember exactly. Now fully adapting into the local context, local environment, right? Uh, I, I was there like seven days continuously in the, in the chariot festival and complete observer, you do not participate, but the, the host guest relationship between the beach boys and the tourists, right? And this is an observer as participant, and this is somewhat old photo. And uh, mm, yeah, we made our visit to uh, the uh, Watapalai Kovil in, uh, in, in Mulatiu, right? All, all these people are, uh, are Indians because we do not have these workers uh, who are specialized in the, te the temple construction. So uh, there are some people coming uh, still here in Sri Lanka, having come from India. So uh, we went there to observe certain phenomena there, right? And this is our uh, this is observation of the funeral rituals at Yafna, the Kirimale, right? They know our existence, our presence, and we have received the <clears throat> due uh, approvals, their consent to observe the things there. Okay. And next step is case study protocol. We need to have a protocol when we are collecting the data. And it has one thing in common with the survey questionnaire, because both directed as a single data point. We, we have the objective of reaching one particular data point or getting one data point, and that is our common objective. And beyond this, similarity are major differences. The first the protocol contains the instrument, but also contains the procedures and general rules to be followed in using the protocol. So we have to we have to establish our research instruments first. How we are going to collect the data? Is it the interviews? So is it the observations? Or is it some other instruments? And thereafter, we think about the other elements. And the second protocol is directed at an entirely different party than that of a survey questionnaire. And third, having a case study protocol is desirable under all circumstances, but essential if you are doing a multiple case study. So the protocol basically uh, has uh, uh, four sections. Actually, uh, this is again, uh, according to Yin, you can customize it the way you want uh, with the support uh, and the consent of your supervisors. First, you need to, in the section one, in your study protocol, you can have your objective right and what issues you are going to address and relevant readings about the topic being investigated so that is all the homework in the section a section one right and number two uh, or section b is the data collection procedures including uh, the identification of the like of the data sources presentation of credential to the field contacts and other logistical reminders and everything you need to plan your entire study and section uh, C, data collection questions, specific questions that the case study researcher must keep in mind in collecting data and the potential sources of evidence for addressing each question. Like, you know, uh, we can have like 20 different questions in our questionnaire, but uh, you need to again look into how long we are, they are going to be with you. You need to get the time, maybe one hour, two hours. If it is so, when to ask which questions, the order of importance, you need to, you need to assess that. Sometimes, okay, you keep on talking about the background information. Sometimes may, maybe they're demographic information, but the time has ticked and at the end of half an hour. Okay, he says, okay, I need to go. 
right and you 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 took a great effort in uh, in finding this respondent informant and the time is up so you need to be careful about the order of questions as well right and and again building the trust gain the their confidence and and they will be able to uh, share more information with you confidently and the section d guide for case study report especially how you are going to draft it write it outline format of the data use and presentation of other document bibliographical information etc and remember that especially the qualitative research findings need to be analyzed then and there right in quantitative research we conduct our pilot study we uh, we, we get our questionnaire field we go back we uh, say uh, we have like 100 or 300 or 500 we enter into our spss we then we do the analysis after collecting the data up uh, i mean after pilot study yes the main study we have the 500 but in qualitative research it is not like that we can collect like maybe the information from three respondents we conduct like in-depth interviews or semi-structured interviews then you transcribe it and the transcriptions need to be analyzed on the and their basis or ad hoc basis sometimes Right, you first analyze it and then you identify okay, what are the patterns, what are the trends, and what are the repetitive courses and everything. Identify that and then you go for the fourth interview, right? And so, uh, over the time, after completing maybe eight or nine or 10 or 15th interview, you will feel okay, this is the saturated point I need to stop at this place. So, uh, the case study protocols are important, very much important. And then we come to the asking questions. Questions, uh, we have different levels when we are going to ask questions. Level one is this, uh, the questions asked of a specific interviewee, right? You can have some questions ready for person one, person two, person three, person four, like that. And the questions asked of the individual case, these are the questions in the case study protocol to be answered by the researcher during a single case. So the support of the literature with the support of the, your protocol, you can have some specific questions to be asked from the respondents belong to one particular uh, individual case. And level three questions, questions asked of the patterns finding across multiple cases. Sometimes, you know, we need to uh, find the data about our, some exclusive data, which is coming only from our case study. And again, we need to get some data which are supporting some previous literature, or maybe the literature coming from different countries, because in the analysis, we have to show to which extent our study supports the international findings. And we also need to show to which extent our findings are different from the international findings, right? So that is where we, we are going to establish a kind of a uniqueness to our case, our research. And you can ask a level four questions as well, which is about the entire study. Basically, after asking all these questions, now the respondent also has some idea, okay, this guy wants, uh, is keep on asking about these questions, right? And so he answered all, and finally, you can you can ask the question, okay, what do you think about this particular case? And what are, what are your suggestions to overcome this particular issue? About the representing the entire case, you can ask the questions. And finally, we have the level five question, normative questions about policy recommendations and conclusions going beyond the narrow scope of the study. The normative questions, right? The particular questions about the, especially about the, uh, the empirical, uh, implementations you can ask. So uh, we have the data collection source as well. Uh, from an individual, about an individual, what you are going to ask. And again, from an organization, about an individual, what you can ask. And from an individual, about an organization, and from an organization, about an organization. So now here, what you have to uh, study is that, understand is that when you are collecting the dot. Uh, collecting the data, go for the the the, the tiniest structures or segmenting to the smallest piece to collect the data. If you can ask the questions from the cleaners, from the plumbers, or from any of the uh, people in the organization which you think as important to your study, please go go for it. Right? We cannot ignore any type of the data. You can ask about the questions about their behavior, attitude, perception right, maybe policies, records, right, so and so forth, right. So, uh, so the study here concludes the individual, if the case study is an individual, if the case study is an organization. So, however, uh, this is 
not we cannot apply in this uh, cross sectionally this might we need to customize this according to our research requirement and uh, the, the other thing is that uh, uh, we we can see the pilot case studies uh, even in qualitative research right not many people are doing pilot case studies in qualitative research but in quantitative yes right when our students come with their wonderful operational operationalization table with like and then they come with the nice questionnaire you simply ask okay do the pilot study and show me that value and this value so they find 50 or 100 students do the analysis and show you and then you are confident about the data and giving the approval for the student to go for the main data collection you know similarly we and do some rich information or data collection process in the qualitative research as well. A pilot case study will help you to refine your data collection plans with respect to both content of the data and the procedures to be followed. In this regard, it is important to note that a pilot test is not a pretest. And the pilot case is more formative, assisting you to develop relevant lines of questions, possibly even providing some conceptual clarification for the research design as well. And the, and the findings of the pilot case study can also be used in your analysis. Now, uh, in, in my Beach, Beach Boys study, I did the pilot case study with two, uh, two or three senior Beach Boys, right? Because I, I didn't know the scope of these, uh, the operations of the Beach Boys and what type of services they were given. I mean, I just selected this topic out of curiosity. And however, with the support of the pilot case study, I was able to develop a kind of a framework within which then I uh, start, I, 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 I uh, ask the questions during the next rounds of interviews from the Beach Boys. So pilot case studies can be uh, recommended. And then we come to the six sources of evidence where when it comes to the qualitative data collection, basically the documentations, whatsoever the say the policies and, uh, and the, this document, that document, yes, they are important. And each of these data sources are having their strengths and the weaknesses, archival records, right? Interviews are also sources of evidence you can use in your case studies, observations, right? and the participant observation and maybe physical artifacts. You go to the, I told you the, the Samadhi stupa, right? Look at it and try to generate some meanings there, right? And uh, the four principles of uh, case study data collection. Number one, you need to use multiple sources of evidence as much as possible right as much as possible we call it the triangulation different types of data actually when it comes to the triangulation it is not only about the data we are talking the uh, data triangulation method triangulation theory triangulation and investigator triangulation that if you can triangulate all your methods data theories and the, even the researcher the validity of your research goes high if all my research actually all my published works i use triangulation very very much I, I do not entirely believe in the i do not entirely believe in the uh, observations i do not entirely believe in the journal or the newspaper articles no i always have my curiosity my my suspicion about my research question so i keep on asking uh, the same question from different data sources which helped me to strongly and to build my case as a uh, answer to my research problem and principle number two, uh, create a case study database. So uh, the data or evidence, the evident, uh, evident base you need to create by yourself. That you need to be report within an article, report, a book, or maybe you can record it in an oral form. And thereafter, you have to maintain a chain of evidence, which means, okay, maybe there are some pieces of information in the articles, pieces of information in the report, pieces of information in the book. So what pieces of information need to be changed to get, right? Whatever the related, maybe under one theme, there could be a couple of themes, there could be 10 themes, right? Everything comes from your database, right? And you need to maintain a chain of evidence. And if you have more evidences, it will again increase the reliability of your study, right? Any any questions before moving into the analyzing the case study data? We have five different methods in analyzing the case study data.
sir will you discuss the validity criteria in terms of the case study in this uh, session uh I, I if time permits only because i have a slide separately to discuss it let's see okay sir right analyzing the case one is the pattern matching uh, although i mean if you go to articles i might i might not have used the pattern matching or the the crowd matching or so uh, different uh, terms are these are exactly what we have used so it is up to you the researchers can decide whether to use terminologies but i highly recommend you to use this for terminologies when you are going to uh, justify your research methodologies for the examiners and for case study analysis, one of the most desirable techniques to use is to use pattern match is uh, pattern matching logic. Such a logic compares an empirically based pattern that is one based on the findings of your case study with the predicted one before you collected your data. Sometimes with the light of the literature, the support of the literature, you can develop like uh, proposition I told you, right? And if you get the evidences to support your propositions, that is like matching the patterns, right? You will find some relevant data and you can group them together. And if the empirical and predicted patterns appear to be similar, the results can help the case study to strengthen the internal validity, right? So you, you postulate, you hypothesize, okay, there is a, this type of relationship, I mean, at qualitatively. And then when you are analyzing the new field, my goodness, yes, it is same. The my similar to the, the Oklahoma study or the Fujiyama study or some other study from some other country. So we call it the internal validity. So which means you have uh, properly and accurately this, uh, develop your research problem and even interview questions and you have applied, the, uh, applied them in the proper, uh, correct research uh, uh, context, right? And then uh, you come to the differences. Uh, and there are patterns patterns cannot be generated you need to revisit the initial proposition you might have done some mistakes and definitely in qualitative research this pattern matching is important now this is a kind of a pattern match that you can see we can conduct the use many uh, interviews and then we analyze it and then you identify you you have to mention the some key uh, key phrases of information separately and this is this is my respondent one two three four five respondents right and then you can combine the the similar uh, uh, respondents together or similar responses together right so yellows uh, belongs to one pattern right and the greens belongs to another pattern you can also call it a theme right threads another theme like that and this is also a pattern matching in my uh, uh, transitional domestic gas tourist uh, domestic tourist gas paper i already sent it to you via the chat box and uh, the we have the open codes focus codes and overarching themes actually now here i have impl i have done the thematic analysis that is also a, a kind of pattern machine in case study we call it the uh, pattern machine so whatever the related information you together and you give a name to it in thematic analysis we call it the focus codes and the relevant focus codes are again collected and give a, a name and that is theme dialogue and actually you can also combine these three and make a kind of a new theory a, a give birth to a new concept and that is what we call as grounded theory if you don't have a proper theoretical uh, backing Right, and this is also a kind of a pattern ma machine that we did, uh, that we uh, abstracted from, uh, uh, that we generated from the NVivo software, right? And there are uh, about uh, POSO travels to Jaffna. Uh, we had like four key themes, and uh, one is places to visit, pre-visit motivation, reconciliation, and the pre-visit destination image. And each of these themes, have like different number of categories based on the information we received. And this is like a uh, pattern matching. And once you click on any of these small uh, icons, you will get a lot of related information in it. So this is one way of analyzing your data and it is the most popular way of data pattern matching for case studies. And number two is explanation building. 
The goal is to analyze the case study data by building an explanation about the case, right? You, it, it basically goes with the interpret reason. You look at the situation, right? Now, this example, uh, we have been to the, the corporal, uh, corporal's place in uh, Elephant Past. We give an interpretation to it and we visit the uh, the other temple in, in the uh, Northern Peninsula, right? We give an interpretation to it. So this is like explanation building. So everything has a story, its own story to tell. So in, in case studies, you have to give the life to these stories, the beliefs, right? Maybe some what is mentioned in the uh, ancient chronicles you have to consider and explain how or why something has happened. So how this incident happened, why is, why is it happened, right? And so many. And in most case studies, explanation building occurs in narrative form because such narrative cannot be precise. The case studies are the ones in which the explanation reflects some theoretically significant propositions whose magnitude might start to offset the lack of precision. So the precision uh, might be some problems in some other cases, right? But in qualitative research, we cannot expect uh, it in all the time, and we cannot expect the same answer over 10 respondents. So over two respondents, no. But in quantitative, the differences may be low, but in qualitative, differences might be bigger because we give the full freedom for the re respondent to respond to our question. So many reasons affect that. And uh, right. And then we come to... Uh, and we have the iterative nature of explanation building, which means that, say you, you uh, the, this uh, Hasalaka Gamini, Corporal Hasalaka Gamini's case, you develop it with the, with the light of the, you know, the ethnic violence and the single is only bill, right? You have to go to that level, or maybe you can go to the uh, King Elara's period, the, the war to the Hindus and the Buddhists in different times as well. Right, so you keep on building the explanation, but in the meantime, uh, I mean, you you read it out, and then uh, after writing it down, two months later, you read while you are reading it out for the second time, you will understand. Okay, there are some points that you missed, right? So you can revisit it. We call it the iterative nature of explanation building. It is like you have half completed a big jigsaw puzzle, right? But find some pieces maybe here and there another couch on the table something like that. so you have to uh, put that missing piece into the puzzle to make it a bigger and whole story and revising the statement or proposition of or comparing the deed against the revision we need to do that as well and comparing the revision to the findings from or more cases Okay, because there are going to be many stories and this particular story is going to make a big difference in our, in our other cases. And repeating this process as many times as required, right? It will be, uh, you cannot decide it and you have, to, you have to keep on doing it till you reach the like maybe theoretical saturation. And then we have the time series analysis. I'm quite sure you have heard this name, time series analysis where we do the statistical uh, analysis to identify uh, the occurrence, occurrence of certain phenomena, right? Maybe with respect to money, economic development, employment, so on and so forth, or maybe foreign currency, but we can do it with the support of a software that is time series analysis, and it can, it can be considered as a case study as well. We, then we have the finding the logic model now, I also follow the logic model, whereas you have like uh, the propositions one. Say there's one proposition, you do a case study and the input of proposition one, sorry, the output of proposition one will be the input of proposition two, right? And then with that, you go for the field study to conduct the, uh, uh, the uh, case study, right? And you analyze it and whatever the outcome, from the proposition two will be uh, will be attributed to proposition three as inputs, right? And you further analyze it and then you have an outcome. So that is known as the logic model. Whereas the 
output of one proposition will be an input of another proposition. So there are many studies that we conduct in this manner, which is also uh, very much valid in the, uh, in the qualitative uh, landscape. So logic model stipulates and operates, operationalizes a complex chain of occurrences or events over an extended period of time. We, we have to look at maybe five years, 10 years, but in my case, it is more than 10 years. And the, event, the events are staged in repeated cause effect, cause effect pattern, whereby a dependent variable and at an earlier stage becomes the independent variable for the next stage. So it goes like that. Right. And then the fifth way of analyzing the case study data cross case synthesis. The technique is especially relevant. Most than having only a single case. Now, see, I will directly take you to the uh, when this example. Now, in my study, I was considering I was doing the ethnic nationalism and the civic nationalism and how the post-war development. The there are the three main cases we conducted: the ethnographic findings, social media reviews, and this one is, I think, uh, all right. The, the, another item so this is cross uh, cross case synthesis however there are now see there are some similarities we have the political component here and we have the political component here as well we also have the attraction here and the attractions here and the amenities no only the second case has and the destination attribute second case has and the experience so destination attribute and the experience belongs to the uh, first case so go i go back the technique is especially relevant if a study consists of at least two cases. See, I have two cases. So we use the uh, cross-case synthesis. And the analysis is likely to be easier and the findings likely to be more robust than having only a single case. Having more than two cases could strengthen the findings even further. And the cross-case synthesis can be performed when the individual case studies have previously been conducted and independent research studies. Right, or as pre designed part of the same study. Now, uh, in here, we, we did it as a pre, pre designed part, pre developed part. Two studies were conducted separately, and then we did the pattern matching. However, according to Yin, uh, he says that you can uh, pattern match your findings with the, uh, with the pre developed case, maybe by another author at another country on a, a different time period. Yes, that can also be done. And uh, right, in either situation, the technique treats each individual case study as a separate study. In this way, techniques does not differ from other research synthesis, aggregating the findings across series of individual cases. So finally, we can combine them. Right, and uh, then we have the report in the case study findings, the, uh, the final uh, section, section six. When we are going to uh, report the case study findings, we have to be very much careful because sometimes our reviewers, our journal readers, or maybe our uh, when I was reading for the PhD, my supervisor always, when he when you get a new application, the journal the student has referred to when developing the uh, when developing the research proposal. So uh, when so we need to be careful about reporting all this information. A case study does not follow any stereotype form. No, in the journals you have a particular conventional standard. In dissertation, you have a particular uh, standard depending on the uh, standards of the, or the policies of the university, but in the case studies, you don't need to. Even in my, uh, my study, since it is a case study method, I did not have a separate methodological section, no methodology section. I will show you, you might not believe. Actually, uh, my, my professor told me I don't need to, I mean, I really wanted to have the methodology section, but he said otherwise. Right. Yeah. 
right so so chapter 1 is basically the introduction chapter you can see my screen right my this and table of content samira can you see hello yes sir we can see we can, yes, see. We can see thank you thank you right here you can see the first chapter is the introduction part but here i have a given a very simple uh, entry to my research method just two pages right 21 to and research framework also okay maybe three four pages and my second chapter literature review my third chapter research field right now <laughs> there's no separate uh, yeah there's no method, but under uh, it's also part of the literature actually it's a field of the context and then Oh, research on uh, construction of ethno-religious nationalistic and uh, civic nationalism through post-war tourism case in Jaffna. But under that, I have the way I think. See, case study design and the procedure. How, right? And how I collected the data and what, what was my theoretical stance, my stance on this case, right? And this study one, even study two, I had the design and procedure under which the thematic analysis and the data triangulation analysis and in vivo, everything has been discussed. And even in case study three, the same thing. And chapter five, so the quantitative approach, I told you it's a mixed method research. And here I have the research method and hypothesis, two pages, hypothesis development, right? Uh, that is from 270 to 200 are there. Then site, right? So all the quantitative analysis are there. And chapter six is the conclusion, see? So there is no research methodology part in my in my school, in my university. So you have to, however, now don't try to remove the methodology part from your case study. You have to discuss it. You, I mean, I'm sure you have been given like, some formats to follow. You have to stick stick to that format. But what I want to highlight is that in case studies, there's no uh, hard fast format to follow, right? Basically, uh, you need to justify your method to your uh, supervisors and your examiners. Going back to my presentation, sharing my presentation, right? And most of the notable case study scholars have been ones who like to compose and also actually had a flair of writing for presenting results orally. Like now, the case studies are actually they are sometimes they are like stories, right? You have to explain them in a narrative form and present it to the audience. So uh, to do good case studies, you should want to become good at composing and not merely to put up with it, right? You need to logically arrange the data and present them. And the case study report can include textual and the non-textual and the graph charts, bar charts and everything. And my, my PhD thesis also came up with an audio track, right? which I included as a CD about some, some incidents and some videos as well. So you have that freedom. Uh, right. Now it is 12 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to wind up the session. We have some other commitments as well. And uh, yeah, there's another important thing I want to discuss here, right? So when you are following a multiple case study method, please pay attention to here. You can have a single case study and single unit of analysis. So in the report, you can present the findings. You can list them, finding one, finding two, finding three, three like that. Or if a multiple case study where you have more than one, you can present the case one, you can present this, uh, if this is what I followed as well in one case. The case one, maybe Jaffna case, maybe Motiv case, maybe Mana case, and then the findings come. Finding one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Then it is clear. We have another option to present our multiple case studies. The finding one may be about the culture. Oh, sorry, for, for peace building. That is my finding one. 
how it happened in Jaffna, how it happened in Mulatil, how it happened in Mana. Then post-war development, how it happened in Jaffna, Mulatil, Vaunia. And this one is reconciliation. Jaffna, Mulatil, Vaunia. But here, Vaunia, we put Vaunia here and then post-war peace building, post-war tourism, and post-war economic building. This is, okay, this is Jaffna, this is Vaunia. Again, we repeat the same thing. So there are two ways of presenting the data. Always remember that. So this is another area where our researchers get uh, confused uh, themselves. Right. And here, it is again important, the case identities. Now, conventionally, we did not confident to uh, post the names of our respondents or maybe the cases. But now the latest literature says that if it is, if you are not, in, uh, if you are not going to reveal some, some, some confidential information or many, or maybe some sensitive information, you need to expose yourself and your respondents, of course, with their con uh, consent and the names of your research site. So that is important when it comes to case identification. Right. Mm, right. Okay. So this is the uh, reliability and validity cases. We don't have the time to discuss in length, but it is important that we discuss the reliability. We, we ensure the reliability and the validity of our case study and our qualitative research by, so, uh, by means of triangulation. We discuss about triangulation and the clarification of research bias. Sometimes researchers may be biased to the data, may be biased to the respondents because of their ethnic background, religious background as well. So we need, maybe we need to do a declaration and the persistent observation, which means some, for a longer period, you observe, you be there, you observe the phenomena and then you report it. And the prolonged engagement, similar to kind of persistent observation, but here you engage with your uh, you, unit of analysis or whatever the context there. And the thick description means the rich description. You have to explain everything in detail. We also have the member check-in. You can ask one of your research members to go through your transcripts or you, maybe you are providing hierarchies, you are everything to check whether you have followed the proper structure. And then we have the external editing. We can invite uh, some external uh, um, people, some experts to look into your cases. Actually, these are just uh, four, five, six, seven of them, but we have more. For example, we have the back translation, another method, and we also have, uh, yeah, we discuss about the triangulation. We also have, we need to also discuss um, about uh, uh, the dis uh, building the discussions in comparative terms with respect to the international findings, local findings, to show to which extent your study similar or different to the other studies, right? And again, we can have the, uh, in, in order to ensure the quality of a case study, we can have the construct validity, internal validity, external validity, and the reliability. There are also some of the methods. I'm sure some of you are familiar, but you can uh, uh, check for it. So these are the two main recommended texts. Actually, uh, in order to make this uh, presentation, I mainly use these uh, two books, the Robert uh, E's Case Study Research and Application Design and Methods. This is a SAGE publication. Uh, 2018, and second one is Sage Handbook of Qualitative Research, uh, Denzins, 2017. Highly recommended these two books, especially the E book. He's uh, the pioneer in the uh, case study with the uh, modern era. So with that, I uh, conclude this session. I will maybe we can spend one minute for questions. If you have any, yes, sir, may I ask you a question? So can you show that oh, last slide, the two books? Yeah, 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 Ms. Dilipa, give me a second. So may I ask you a small question? Yes, please. Uh, so my uh, topic is, my topic yeah. is to get political challenges in the execution of Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Uh, I have considered cases in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Uh, wh what? Uh, I didn't uh, get 
uh, yeah, uh, security and political challenges in the execution of Belt and Road Initiative. Cases of Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, actually, I want to know, sir, uh, with regard to the analysis part, uh, uh, I was instructed to use at the initial stage, I am uh, still at the initial stage, code techniques to be used for the analysis. Code techniques. Uh, code. Code, code. I didn't code. get that word. Code. Code technique. Code technique. Actually, I want to know pattern analysis and code techniques are same. Uh, if not, please explain how qualitative, uh, how uh, code techniques can be used to analyze qualitative data. Right. Rumesh, uh, thank you, Rumesh, for the question, but uh, I'm not familiar with code technique, right? Actually, um, sir, I, uh, I am also not familiar with uh, sociological research. <laughs> That's why I ask. Um, can, uh, yes, yeah, Rumesh, you can, you can drop me an email. I will write my email address in the chat box and okay. uh, then I will find some uh, data sources. So I will uh, study it and I will send you some. Okay, sir. Uh, yeah, you can drop me an email, but I'm also very busy with all the words, but I will try my level best to respond to your inquiries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So is, is your thesis available? Is there any way that, I mean, we can read the, your thesis? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the publications of my thesis were already sent to you. Were you able to download them? Yeah, yes, sir. Right. Uh, the, the people have, I will try to get with you. Thank you. Applications of the thesis actually, uh, we already shared. Uh, someone can. Uh, Wait, I will uh, share the link again. You can log into this particular uh, uh, link and download the publications. Right, okay. So I'm going to wind up and thank you very much for your attention. And remember the case studies are like, it's a wonderful method. Uh, that we use in the qualitative research importantly because there are not many uh, restrictions in conducting the case studies unlike the quantitative methods and again you can decide to which extent to go right and to which data to explore and thereafter set your own limitations and the boundaries and you are going to be the boss of the research as well and when doing so remember you need to have a good interpretive skill, analytical skill, right? To be able to screen out the societies, the phenomena and context to get some idea uh, or shed more light into the knowledge. And I personally believe that the qualitative research can contribute more to the body of knowledge, especially now Sri Lankan academic sector, we are not contributing much to the, the theory development in well, right, we don't see in the sociology part as well, right, even in my area, we haven't contributed much valuable thing to the theory, but using the grounded theories and other qualitative methods, I hope together as a team, we will be able to do that. And uh, I look forward to uh, join with you in future as well. I'm available in, uh, in Facebook, Sri Lanka Research Community Facebook page. It's a kind of a social uh, initiative, non-profit. So you can join and we conduct many webinars for the researchers, so uh, free of charge. And if you organize anything, you can invite us. We also have an expert panel willing to contribute or share our knowledge with you all. And uh, I now I uh, pass my thanks to, again, the, uh, uh, the Dean Sir as well, and uh, the, the symposium chairs, Dean Sirs, and uh, the conference organizers and the compere 
and thank you very much sabaragam university for inviting me sampas thank you sir and it it's been a, a wonderful session actually uh, i also got the opportunity to update my knowledge after some time right so uh, uh, i hope i did my best <laughs> thank you sir thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Manoj. And uh, with that, we come to the end of day one of uh, the two-day workshop organized in conjunction with ICSSL uh, 2023. So to commemorate the event, we would like to take a photograph. So if it's possible, dear participants, after the following thanking note by uh, our secretary, please do uh, turn your videos on to take a picture. So now let me invite our conference secretary, Dr. Hiruni Rupa Singha, to deliver the thanking note. Thank you, Ashani. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, dear distinguished uh, resource person, Dr. Manoj Samarthunga, Dean Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages, all academic staff members, all authors, all students, and uh, all other participants. It is my uh, great pleasure to state that the workshop on uh, quality to data analysis with uh, special reference to case studies uh, is a great success. So many people have contributed uh, in numerous ways to uh, make this a successful program. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our resource person, Dr. Manoj Samarathunga, senior lecturer in the Department of uh, Tourism and Hospital Management, Hajarati University of Sri Lanka. You are deeply appreciated uh, for sharing your valuable insight as the resource person of the pre-conference workshop. I'm sure that all of our participants are inspired uh, by your great words. You have provided an excellent value addition to our conference uh, with your attractive and informative workshop today. Then I deeply uh, convey my heartiest gratitude to Dr. Sampat Pranandu, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Languages for being with us and guiding us throughout the program. I also extend my uh, Thanks to conference organizing committee members, including uh, workshop committee members, Professor Manohari Udupurva and Dr. Lekhamge for their efforts to accomplish the given tasks to make this event realize. And also I would like to uh, thank all the academic staff members, all the authors, all students, and uh, all other participants who have supported us and joined us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kumudu, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. All right. Are we taking the photo? Yes. Ah, nice. Thank you. Yeah, some some familiar faces appear now. <laughs> Dr. Samarakon, Dilipamis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Saman, hello, sir. Hello, Doctor. Okay. Finish. Thank yes. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and always for the conference. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir.